good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our dear attendees here and online. That's why I do the wide greetings. Welcome to the seminar series of ENGL. And it's a great pleasure to start the seminar series of this academic year. And who to start it uh, with? Of course, the best option here uh, is the best option is our one and only Professor Tay. Please give a round of applause. Thank you very much. Little bit of introduction, although introductions are not needed. We all uh, know him and we like him and we have learned so much from him. But Professor Tay is a professor of cognitive linguistics and data analytics in the School of Humanities, Nanyang Technological University. He is trained in linguistics and computational mathematics and has held academic positions in New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Singapore. His research interests include cognitive linguistics, metaphor theory, mental health care discourse, and data analytics machine learning. He is co-editor-in-chief of Metaphor and Social Work, associate editor of Metaphor and Symbol, and academic editor of Plus One. And today he's going to talk about the performance interpret. I knew that I'm going to mix this one. <laughs> Interpretability trade-off, not a problem for discourse analysis. So as we do the seminars, um, 50 minutes of talk followed up by 10 minutes of QA. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Azar. Thanks a lot for attending uh, this talk. It's, it's great to be back, right? I, I left Hong Kong four, four months ago, but it feels like an eternity. <laughs> it's good to yeah come back and see you guys and to present this uh, ongoing research. So today is really kind of more asking more questions than giving answers because it's part of an ongoing project that just commenced. So I'm also looking forward to a lot of uh, feedback and, and comments as well. I hope everyone can, can hear me as well as those online. All right, so the title suggests that there is some kind of uh, argument that a certain issue that is supposed to be problematic in a certain field turns out to be not so in another field. And this problem that I'm going to talk about is called performance interpretability trade-off or PIT, henceforth, right? Uh, which is a very well-known dilemma, so to speak, in data science, right, in general. And I'm sure some of us in the audience already know about it. But then uh, I want to talk about the fact that in the context of this cost analysis, however, which is an underexplored domain of application for data analytics, right, for various reasons, right, it turns out instead to be an opportunity rather than a problem because it gives us some new perspectives and it also allows us to consider this cost analysis, therefore, as an example of a domain in which domain knowledge should really influence how data analytics proceeds. All right, so let's hope this works. And I, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'll do this instead. Yeah. All right. So I, I probably won't take 50 minutes, partly because I don't have that much to say, and also partly because I would hope for more questions, answers, and, and things of that nature. Okay. So I'll start with defining PIT, right, in the context of data science, and then also highlighting the point that. In data science, there is this emphasis on uh, look, allowing the knowledge of the domain of application of data science to influence data analytic decisions. In other words, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to do data science. And therefore, this cost analysis being an underexplored domain turns out to highlight this point and also turns out to allow this cost analysts to underline the theoretical import of their work for another field as well. Okay, so and then I'll talk about PIT and this cost analysis and develop my main claim that PIT is an opportunity, not a problem, followed by substantiating these very speculative points with a case study that I just recently concluded on uh, some YouTube social media discourse data across time. In other words, time series data. Okay, so what is PIT? You know, if you use an idiom to summarize it, it's about the fact that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Because there is an inherent balance between how well a machine learning or a, a statistical model performs 
So how well it fits a certain data set, how accurate its predictions are, okay? And how interpretable it is to, to mere mortals like us, okay? So it is well known, in fact, across many domains of application, like healthcare, like business, and, and the, the stereotypical domains of data analytics application, right? That more complex models with a lot of parameters, with a lot of uh, hyperparameters that are well-tuned with a large data set and things and so on and so forth, tend to make better predictions and decisions, right? Unsurprisingly, right? Because they are very sophisticated models with the latest algorithms and things like that, right? But then what is being sacrificed is understandability, right? So the classic example is neural networks, right? So neural network models, uh, some of you may know that they are extremely powerful, right? Like ChatGPT, right? They are extremely accurate, but humans, it's a black box because humans cannot tell why they work so well. Okay, the intricacies of the model and the way in which the model arrives at a prediction is something that cannot be easily decomposed and understood by mere mortals, right? Ironically, even those that program these algorithms don't understand how they work, okay? So that is a bit of an interesting point, okay? So therefore, if we want something to be more accurate, we sacrifice the ability to control it in a sense or to understand it and vice versa. If we want the mastery and the control over it, then we have to concede that they may not perform as well as alternatives. Okay? So a classic example is facial recognition with neural networks, which is getting increasingly popular. So the fact that you know the nowadays you know machines can recognize your face and identify exactly who you are, which makes it very high performing. But the point is there are some ethical issues, even scientific issues as to the fact of how is this made possible? What exactly is it about a model that allows them to discriminate faces to such a high degree of accuracy? And so that already manifests a certain trade-off, okay? So obviously there are implications across different domains as you can imagine, okay? But across all these domains, which of course excludes this cost analysis for pretty obvious reasons that we'll talk about later on, uh, it is often seen universally as, as a challenge. So the pit is, is, is a problem. It's something that needs to be solved and it is something that needs to be improved upon. In other words, we should try to eliminate this trade-off either by improving the algorithms, right? Or by making a pragmatic compromise between these two ends. But regardless of the perspective, it is seen as something to be resolved, okay? And another sub point is that when we talk about a PIT, as I will show shortly, it is often seen as a matter of comparing between algorithms, different algorithms, so it's always like algorithm A performs better, but is less interpretable. Algorithm B is vice versa. Rather than perhaps looking at it inter intra-algorithmically, right? So that's another possible gap or angle whereby instead of comparing PIT across algorithms like this, we zoom in on one algorithm and then explore how P and T, or P and I, sorry, how P and I uh, interrogate one another. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. So this is a very standard uh, kind of graph you will see that visualizes the PIT. As you can see, there are two axes, right? One is the interpret, interpret I'm not the only one that can pronounce this word. So the interpretability axis and the performance axis. So you can see that a very simple algorithm like linear regression, like this is really machine learning 1101, right? Linear regression is just a line of best fit between the data points. And it turns out that for a lot of data sets, it is rather poor in performance, right? But it is extremely transparent and interpretable because you can clearly see y equals to you know, better not plus better one x, and you can know exactly what it corresponds to, right? And as you go down the list, okay, decision trees starts to get a little less interpretable, right? Because you have a lot of nodes and it starts to kind of permutate and stuff like that. And then as you go further down all the way to the other end of neural networks, the next frontier, right? Whereby it is extremely accurate, but nobody understands why. Okay, so therefore think in terms of, uh, so today I will try to fit this cost analysis into this kind of framework and talk about what we should uh, be concerned with. So just to compare the two extreme ends to illustrate my point, right? linear regression is high I and low P, whereas uh, neural networks is high P and low I, right? So for example, you know, a regression model looks like this, right? Y is better not, better one, X one. 
where y is the model outcome, you have the predictors or the independent variables or the features, right? X1, X2, all the way to Xn. And beta naught is intercept and, you know, beta one, beta two are the slopes, right? And of course the residual term. So I guess this is, a lot of us may already know this, right? So if you look at this model, it's quite clear, for example, if your outcome is, let's say in applied linguistics, let's say it's a, it's a test score, right? English test score. And then your predictors can be various kinds of things like study hours, you know, your family income or whatever. Okay. So if you fit this model, even though it may not perform that well, like so in linear regression, we can use like R square, you know, or root mean square error, that kind of metric, right? To evaluate the model. And let's say if even if it's not great, but you can still interpret it very well because the feature outcome relations are conceptually transparent. Right, so for instance, in this case, for example, if, if beta one is 3.5, then clearly we are saying that, you know, one additional study hour predicts an increase in test score by 3.5. So this is very interpretable, it's very transparent, it's theoretically uh, easy to apply it to your hypothesis or whatever. Okay, and then on the other hand, you have you have neural network like this, right? So this is the simplest neural network I can think of, it's like feed forward, right? And only one layer, uh, only one layer, right? And only one uh, neuron, actually, right? So we, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially the idea is if you look, if you compare this with this, you can find that it is very hard to map all these parameters and all these uh, parts of the neural network onto something theoretically transparent. So in other words, if I were to ask you, give you the same data set, right? Explore the link between performance and all those predictors using A, a linear regression, and B, a neural network, right? You will find that for B, is much more accurate, but you don't know what it means. Or rather, you can't theorize on its basis. You can't, as, at least not as clearly as this case, right? Okay, so that is the, uh, the, the backdrop of, the, of the, the crux of the issue at hand which is that, you know, you have this kind of uh, continuum whereby you sacrifice one or the other and there is really, it's really something inherent in the design of, of data science, okay? So to visualize this again, you know, like for example, this one is a linear regression, right? You can see, you can see, you can visualize the parameters that are of consequence very clearly. This one is not so, right? So you can call it a conceptual overkill in this case. Right, the neural network. Okay, so what I hope that is uh, kind of like gives you a good initial foundation for what I'm gonna talk about. So then what has this got to do with uh, this cost analysis, right? So then again, going back, taking one step further, right? If you think about it, the whole idea of machine learning, you know, AI or you know, data analytics is really strange bedfellows with this cost analysis. And although I, I am trying, as you can see, my, my latest book is about talking about how you can apply one to the other. But despite these kinds of efforts, it is still the sad fact that not many people as of today really care about the overlaps between these two. And the reasons why is actually also quite sobering and obvious. All right, number one is that it, the decisions that really, um, undermine, uh, really underpin the importance of machine learning, right? Machine learning is all about making predictions to make better decisions. So in contexts like finance, like healthcare, like education, it is crystal clear why certain decisions are socially important, right? But then in terms of this cost analysis, unfortunately, we can somehow say that the decisions are relatively low stakes. Okay. In other words, if I do a sentiment analysis on movie reviews, that's a classic example, right? So like, who cares? So what if you can predict the sentiment? So in other words, because of this, people might see data analytics as an unnecessary tool, which is perfectly understandable, right? And then also there is this more uh, thorny issue about methodological comfort zones that a lot of people have, right? So in a sense, you are brought up in a certain paradigm, you somehow could understand that there is value in exploring something else, but you know, in a way you kind of say, okay, never mind. You know, what, I can, what I'm doing is enough. You know, I don't really want to touch other things. That's also understandable. Okay? And then there is this resistance in the field towards quantification, generally in discourse analysis. The idea is that it is reductionistic. You know, it, it, 
and numbers don't mean anything, you know, that kind of usual criticisms you hear about quantitative analysis, which also is valid, you know, in some ways. So therefore, because of this, part of the reason why nobody has thought about these kinds of issues before is that there is a lower demand for them so far, at least. Okay. But then I'm saying that we should actually care because obviously, as we can see that the recent trend is towards, you know, AI, you know, towards uh, data science and stuff like that. And because of that, there also arises opportunities. Okay, not just the fact that you got to abandon these kinds of approaches, but the fact that you can complement them. So as I have highlighted right at the beginning, PIT provides opportunities actually uh, for, for this cost analytic uh, theorization, potentially at least. Okay. And more importantly, from the perspective of data science, the idea is that uh, the nature of each domain of application should be allowed to shape the way you do data science. So in other words, if you are a doctor versus if you are an engineer versus a, a banker, you may apply the same algorithm to the same to different data sets. And the way you interpret them, the way you prepare the data, it can range all the way from something as banal as the way you collect your data to the way you process the data and all the way to the most involved part as to the way you analyze the data. All these things are well known to be supposed to be directed by domain knowledge. Okay. So therefore, by exploring how PIT actually manifests itself in discourse analysis, we are actually also showing as discourse analysts that you know, our domain has some characteristics that uh, tell the data scientists, hey, wake up, you know, our, our domain is a bit different. So maybe it's time to theorize different ways to, to analyze discourse data using uh, analytic, analytic tools like that. Right. So therefore, my main claim uh, of uh, today that I want to initially explore, okay, this is a three-year project and I'm in the third month. So, <laughs> so that's a long way to go. So just the beginning, right? So, so PIT is not a problem in this course analysis, but a window of opportunity. Okay, Opportunity for whom, right? For, for this course analysis and potentially even for data scientists, right? Because first of all, it gives us some new theoretical ideas for instance, some of us may already be imagining the analogy between performance and interpretability with quantitative and qualitative research. And the, and the balance between the two, the so-called trade-off as mixed methods research, right? For instance, so there's a kind of potential mapping, conceptual mapping there already, right? So that is new, new opportunity for, for analysts. And it also, like I mentioned, it gives new perspectives on old ideas as well. Okay, and like I also mentioned uh, earlier, it, it it kind of exemplifies the role of so-called humanistic domain knowledge, right? That that is previously tends to be disregarded as a kind of legitimate science, so to speak. Okay, but here we are saying that okay, actually, if you look at if you consider the properties of discourse analysis, it does provide a lot of puzzles, even for data scientists to come to terms with how we can actually approach this kind of data. Okay. So these are the usual uh, trite and, and, and typical examples of how domain knowledge should shape data analytics. For instance, you know, oh, depending on who you are, it should help you define your objectives, you know, select your data, select your features, select the model, and all these things are, and, and the communicating outcomes, ethical issues, all these are very important, but very generic, right? But each field actually has some deeper characteristics that can expand this list. All right? Okay. So I share initial thoughts, right? As <laughs> it's just initial, right? But hopefully you guys can help me along, right? At the most, at the most general level, even when you approach this question at, at, at a surface level, you will already realize that the multivalency or, you know, as some people call it, messiness of this course already rejects a PI dichotomy for a more nuanced view. So in other words, when we do this course analysis, what does it mean for the model to perform? Does it simply mean becoming more accurate in predictions, right? What does it mean to interpret the model in terms of this course analysis? So these are already big questions that are not easy to answer, okay? So for instance, with reference to a recent study, right? So we what we did was we tried to argue that we can predict therapy versus patient language in, in psychotherapy. So, you know, like psychological counseling, our argument is that therapists and patients use language in very distinct ways. 
So what we did was we trained, we, we kind of like quantified linguistic profiles of these two roles, and we tried to see whether we can successfully predict the speaker. And the answer is yes, of course, right? We can. But then if you reflect on this more deeply from the perspective of P and I, right? So high performance in this case would be like, okay, high percentage accuracy, for example. Okay, fine, happy. What is high interpretability, right? So most likely it will be something along the lines of how and why certain linguistic features in the context that they are situated change the probability of the speakerhood, right? So that's interpretability, right? And then any kind of, as we all know as linguists or analysts, any kind of mixed method study would be the preferred way, right? And it will be couched as some kind of indeterminate blend of both. Right, so what exactly would be a good study is somehow trying to show that there is some kind of blend of both these two aspects, but exactly how is not is not so clear. It's not as clear as say predicting stock the stock market. You have a very clear singular objective, right? So that's at a more general level, and at a more specific level, this is where I talked about the fact that this kind of approach gives us new theoretical perspectives. So the new perspective, so called, that I want to talk about today is the elasticities idea. So my argument is that P and I, P being performance and I being interpretability, have different elasticities in this course data. Okay, so what do I mean by this very strange metaphor, right? So if you look at the right-hand side, for instance, if we compare contender models for the same data set, let's say you have two models, A and B, right? Each model ideally will map onto a certain interpretation in context, right? So the idea is that when we compare different models in terms of performance, which we can do via looking at the variables, the parameters, we will realize that perhaps downgrading performance or upgrading, as the case may be, may not lead to a correspondingly proportionate upgrade or downgrade in interpretability. Okay? Unlike what PIT suggests. So remember, the whole idea of PIT is that there is a trade-off and that the more P you have, the less I, the less I, I you have, right? And it is proportionate, I mean, roughly speaking, right? But when you look at actual discourse data, it's not like that at all. In fact, a change in P between models is not going to give you a steady change in I, as I will show you today, which means that the elasticity of performance is different from the elasticity of interpretability, which in turn means that PIT is not a simple trade-off in discourse analysis which in turn means that this also analysis has some unique features that may warrant more attention. Even if the data scientist doesn't care about this cost, they should care about the qualities of this cost, right? And therefore, shake hands with us. <laughs> okay, more. Okay, so then let's use a case study to present these very highly speculative in the air, in the cloud kind of points, okay? So this is a time series analysis of YouTube videos, right? whereby it was the original paper was simply to, as a proof of concept, that we can apply ARIMA time series models, right? Autoregressive integrated moving average. So this is just a class of statistical models, right? To, to, to kind of like model the present value of, for example, if you're modeling the language in a series of videos, right? So this, the language profile of this video, YT, T is the present time, can be modeled in terms of its past values. Okay, so this is called auto-regressive moving average models. Okay, and as I can see on these graphs, indeed, we, I have shown in another, in, in these uh, references that indeed you can do so with a high degree of accuracy. So these, these graphs on the right, the blue line is the actual values uh, quantified using something called LIWC, right? So the, the discourse of the YouTuber, Nikki Diego, the YouTube guru or something like that, right? She performed her identity over nine years. So what we did was we tracked her display of certain tendencies, the analytical thinking over nine years. And the orange line is the model that we fit onto it. And as you can see, it's a very nice visual fit, which means that there is some predictability, time orderliness in her display of uh, identity. Okay. So in other words, what we're going to do today is we are going to look at this series and fit multiple different models and to see, to compare, as the models start to degrade in performance, how do they actually, how interpretable are they on the other side of the equation? Okay, so this is an intra-algorithm case study. 
which is different from the usual inter-algorithm comparison of P and I. Okay, so we started 109 videos over a nine-year span from her debut as a very amateurish, so-called, you know, young, inexperienced YouTuber, all the way to her global recognition as the top 10 Forbes influencers of the year. And as you can see, she has now has 14.6 million subscribers, which is twice Hong Kong's population. Okay, so everyone in Hong Kong is a subscriber and, and your mother as well, right? So twice, okay? So obviously this is a case of tremendous evolution in her, in her style, right? So what we were interested in is the display of analyticity in her language, which is like how many formal or logical words versus informal or personal language that she uses. Because she's a makeup guru, so you would expect that she has to use some formal instructional language. You know, This is how you put the concealer. This is how you put the foundation. And this is what I do. This is what you should do. Versus, hey guys, you know, how is it going? So the balance between these two is what we're interested in. Okay. So for this study, we, 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 we use an iterative approach to fit ARIMA models repeatedly to a train set of 80% of, of, of this data. And for each model, we compute evaluation metrics like you know AIC, root mean square, you know, percentage error, and stuff like that. And then we rank models by performance, and then we want to juxtapose number one versus number two versus number three, and we see to what extent can each model actually explain the, the data that's going on. Okay, so these are our questions. How much deterioration in performance as we move down the list of models? Okay, and how do corresponding context-bound interpretations differ? And are one and two proportionate as implied by the conventional understanding of PIT. So this is our list of models, right? So we fit 17 models iteratively. Each time around, the difference is that we change the order of the model. So these numbers in, in the brackets, they are the order of the model. So for instance, uh, AR1 means we say that the present value is predictable from the most recent video. If it's AR2, then we are saying that the present value is actually also linked to two prior videos, which implies a more sustainable trend. So, so yeah, that's the, the, the basic uh, nature of these models anyway. So the top three models, okay, ranked by AIC. AIC is a measure of model, something like uh, model error. So the lower, the better, okay? So the top three performing models, right? And then we also have the bottom four trash models. <laughs> okay, not trash. Baseline models. So I think if you have a bit of background, you already immediately realize why these models are the worst. Right? The last model is a zero model, which means that every value in the series is just predict predicted to be zero. As you can see, so it's just a straight line across zero. And obviously, it's, it's terrible. Right? And then MA1, AR1, these models don't have an intercept, which means that these models predict the average long-term value of the series to also be zero instead of, a, so in the regression, right, the intercept is like the baseline value, right? So, so that's why they also suck, right? And then the mean model is also like a naive model where every value is just the mean of the series. So they're also terrible, okay? So this already tells us that the series does have some pattern because these baseline reference models are turn out to be the worst and all these models with actual parameters turn out to be better, which implies that the series itself is a suitable target for analyzing these kinds of questions. Because if the series itself is just random variation across time, then all these models would not be so terrible. But that also would imply that this series is not suitable for this case study, right? Because there is no performance versus interpretability to really compare. So we will focus today in my remaining time. Oh gosh, I'm speaking too slowly. My remaining time to, to focus on the interaction between these three models. As you can clearly see, they already manifest two different model types, AR and ARMA, which is a combination of AR and MA. So I'm sorry that I have to presuppose some kind of technical knowledge here because you know it's it's a bit hard to uh to include everything in the introduction. Okay. So so the top three models are actually similar in performance. If you look at the AI, if you look at the AIC, there's is really just one point between them. Okay. In fact, less than one point between them. Okay. So the first model, right? ARI, AR1 plus an intercept. Actually, what it implies, like I said, is that there is a short-term momentum 
in analytical thinking. Because what it says is that if I have a high score in this video, the next video will also be high, which means there's momentum. But then in one video after that, it may drop. Because one video after that, the score has a zero correlation with this score. Can you see? So AR1 simply means the momentum carries forward by one video. And if you think in terms of how that implies to her construction of identity, it implies that she tends to behave in the same way in consecutive videos, but there's no guarantee that in the next video, she will be the same, right? Okay, so that is the best model. That means it best explains the data, quantitatively at least, okay? So if you compare with the second and the third model, right? Quantitatively, there's no real issue. In terms of performance, it's just a matter of different parameters and coefficients. So for instance, this is the first model. This one simply means the long-term average is 30.1. And this coefficient means if this uh, uh, one unit change in this video will predict a 0 0.394 unit change in the next video. So you can think of it as the size of the impact of the previous video. Okay. So in other words, you can also think of it in terms of the next video can explain about 39% of the, of the change, something like that, of, of this video, okay? Then if you just switch to the second model, it looks very similar. All you have is another parameter now, which says that now YT minus two, the two videos before, also exert a small influence, okay? So mathematically, degradations in performance is not really an issue because you are just saying, I'm modeling the effect a bit differently, okay? But then here comes the question. When if you re revisit my, my diagram just now about elasticity, right? So you will find that qualitatively, interpretability, okay? In terms of interpretability, it is not a matter of just degrading. In fact, you require a lot of gymnastics to understand it, okay? So what is the gymnastics, right? So the first uh, gymnast is, okay, if you, so now for the rest of the time, I'm going to simply compare one versus two, and then one and two versus three, just as a quick uh, display. Okay, so AR1 versus AR2, straight away you can see that already the difference between these two is irre irreconcilable qualitatively, because you cannot have a case whereby you claim that the short-term momentum holds both one video and two videos apart at the same time. If you look at the discourse data, you cannot claim that, for instance, if I talk this way in a certain video, and the next one remains the same, then the following one must be different according to the AR1 model. So qualitatively, you can't BS your way out of this and you can't say that, oh, actually the third one is also the same by some magical. Uh, so can you see that the slide from AR1 to AR2 quantitatively is no problem, but qualitatively it generates an almost contradictory interpretation that is not reconciliable. Okay, so that is the first observation about the different elasticity in, in, in P versus I. Okay, the next one is a bit more involved. So if we compare model number one with model number two, AR1 versus ARMA11. So ARMA actually is uh, another component, right? Which actually predicts a different uh, phenomenon. So AR predicts momentum, right? MA actually predicts restoration because MA models is like this. So if I have a very sudden spike in the previous video, if it's an MA1 model, that means in the next video, it will regress back to the, to the mean. So that's why it's got moving average. So therefore it's more a matter of restoration. So if I say something very extreme, maybe I was drunk yesterday, I said something crazy. And then if this morning I recover and I become normal again, and if you model, and then I go drinking tonight again, and then the next, then if you model my talk, it will be an MA1 model because it's about restoration in the short term, okay? But if I drink today and I drink two days later instead, then it will be MA2 model because the restoration is delayed, okay? So ARMA combines both elements, okay? So if you look at the actual score, I highlight just this part from video 24 to 28, right? What we have is actually very interesting because what you see here is that from 24 to 25, the direction switch is expected by the AR, AR1 model, okay? And then it starts to go down, right? And then it goes down again. 
right? So this momentum is also expected by AR1 model because it's down, down, and then you see up. Remember, direction change, okay? So it's expected by AR1 model, but at the same time points, you also have an MA component. So the MA, instead of predicting it to go down, is supposed to go up instead. So you have two conflicting predictions. Can you see? And in this case, the AR1 component wins. Why? Because it went down. Okay. And if you look at the equation, you can see why it wins. Because the AR1 parameter is bigger than the, the MA parameter. So the AR parameter is, is bigger, so-called. Okay. And then in the next, only in the next video do we see the restoration. So the restoration is delayed by the influence of the AR. But when we reach this point, then both components win. Because at this point, the AR1 also will predict a direction switch. You see my point? Okay. So what we have here, to keep a long story short, at this time point, you have two conflicting expectations. And the next time point, you both expectations are the same. Okay. So the problem we have here is how do we reconcile this conflicting uh, expectation? Okay. So, there is, so we have two conflicting expectations. Momentum versus restoration acting upon the same point. Okay, so this poses a problem for interpretability. How do we interpret ARMA model in, in this context? So the, the the solution is to say that okay, wait a minute. Since AR is momentum and MA is restoration, maybe ARMA suggests that there is some kind of prioritization in this course, depending on which force is stronger. So we can interpret whenever we see an ARMA model, we can say that okay. Let's look at the coefficients, right? And then let us examine the discourse to see evidence of the speaker negotiating these two forces. Should I carry on or should I restore? Okay. So if that were the case, if we can find this evidence, then then what? Then there isn't a problem. Because what does that mean? That means ARMA is just as interpretable. Right? However, let us examine the actual discourse to see what's happening. Okay, so 27 and 28, I'm sorry if it's a bit small, right? So video 27 is, is like very, very low analytical thinking score. 19.52 is way below the average, okay? So if you read carefully, right, the, I, I highlighted the parts where it manifests low analytical thinking. And she says, oh, don't ask me why. I don't know what is this. I don't know. You don't have to do everything I say. I suck. You know? So self-denigration, a lot of humor, okay? So it actually follows the strategic drop in video 26, which focus on adolescence. So if you look at the previous video, the video is meant for adolescence. And in this video, she strategically continues this identity construction, which explains the AR model, right? Okay. But then, as you can see, at this time point, we're also expecting restoration. But what we see is only momentum. We only see this cause evidence of momentum. That means she's continuing her style from a previous video. There is actually no discourse evidence of restoration, okay? And there is no clear reason why this is the case because the video is actually no longer explicitly aimed at adolescence, okay? So the model itself would actually predict a restoration, but we only see continued uh, informality, all right? So it is only at video 28 that we realize, hey, ah, now I understand why. Because video 28 happens to be on New Year's Eve. And the score rebounds very sharply as predicted by both components, by ARMA model, okay? So now we understand why there's a delayed restoration. Because at this time point, she's asking for voters for Twitter of the Year Award, Twitter Person of the Year Award, because the vote happens on New Year's Eve. So at this point of time, suddenly you can see she's going to ask for votes in a more imperative kind of way. Okay, vote for me once more. You know, I'm gonna shut up right now. Don't forget to vote for me. Vote for me. You can vote for me. So all that is, you know, a kind, a kind of like imperative language or you know, command, so called, you know, asking for things. Okay. So therefore, the thing is, if we interpret this right, we can see that yes, this interpretation allows us to reconcile the ARMA model because now we understand why there's a delayed restoration. But then the problem is that. This is not really generalizable because it is an idiosyncratic one-off event. So it's like it's almost like a coincidence that only because it's New Year's Eve that we see this pattern. So in other words, we it's not as easy to schematize an interpretation for ARMA as we did for AR and MA. 
So for AR, we can schematically say it is generally about momentum. For MA, we can say it's generally about restoration. But once you put AR and MA together, it is very hard to find an interpretation that is uniformly applicable. But instead, right, the applicability is underpinned by a one-off idiosyncratic event, which is New Year's Eve. So this kind of interpretation may not be replicable onto another context where the RMR model actually fits. Okay, so in other words, the interpretability of the RMR model seems to be much more context bound than the interpretability of the AR or the MA. Okay, so these are very uh, preliminary observations, okay, but they are sufficient to tell us that it is too simple to say that P and I are simply trading off in a very innocuous way. When you get something here, you don't always get a corresponding thing over there. So these issues precisely open the aforementioned window of opportunity because we get new theoretical perspectives. In this case, it's about the elasticity of P and I. And also it showcases DA as exotic domain knowledge. Okay, something that uh, data scientists can pay perhaps more attention to the fact that you know, for a domain whereby which requires in-context interpretation, right? All these so-called universal trade-offs may not simply apply. Okay, so okay, so concluding thoughts. Like I said, I don't have any answers today. Only questions, right? And give me two years and nine more months, maybe half months. Okay, so but of course, questions are important to keep research alive. So some of some of the more uh, bigger questions that hopefully maybe you guys can help me with, right? What does or should he and I mean in this course context? In other words, should we even care about so-called performance? Should we even care about interpretability in, in this course analysis? Okay, Does PIT matter in this course research? And on the other hand, does this course research matter to PIT? So if you show this to a data scientist, they will say, this is not even data, for example. Would that be the case? Or how will you as a discourse analyst fight for your own discipline in that case? Or argue for your own discipline, okay? So then more methodologically, if we use different discourse contexts, so not looking at time series data, but looking at cross-sectional data, okay? From different discourse domains and different machine learning algorithms, so not just ARIMA, but something else, do we observe similar confusing outcomes? Or is it just an artifact of ARIMA models for some weird reason, okay? And lastly, how do we articulate the above as domain knowledge? That means to what extent can we say these characteristics are an in, are inherent part of, of what this course is? Do we proudly embrace these characteristics as this course analysts? Or do we just say, actually, this is all, I don't know what's going on. You know, it's a big mess. It's messy. A messiness doesn't have a good connotation. Right? So instead of saying it's messy, can we systematically articulate the above and to guide future applications? Okay. So if any of these questions sound interesting to you, and if you are looking for a postgraduate position, right, at NTU, so come and contact me, okay? I, yeah, I'm i here to steal your students. I'm sorry for you. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you very much. I, I think I just made it, yeah, so. Okay, so yeah, do we have time for? Thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Professor Tay.